my pleasure to introduce Jessica Doish. She is a fifth year graduate student in my lab and the most creative when it comes to applying several in silico new tools that people put up to query her compounds that she's interested in and annotating them. I highlighted some of the tools yesterday in my talk if you attended, but she's gonna go over quickly those some of those slides and then actually go online, show you how to run a particular tool. There is a cookbook recipe kind of on a, on a slide, so, so you don't have to write down or take notes. Um, we already shared the slides. You should have gotten an email from Laura. If you haven't, let me know. We'll be happy to share the slides. Um, she has also shared the files with you, uh, uh, the mass spectral files. We're doing one compound only, so you can do everything in batch mode. What Jessica is going to show you is with one compound. So the file size is smaller, you can quickly upload it. So try it out if you like today in break. Um, and then if you have any questions, let us know. You, you can try it out next week, next month. If you have any questions, please feel free to e uh, email us. But you don't need to take down a lot of notes. I would recommend really listening to what she's saying rather than taking notes because we're going to provide you the very clear cookbook recipes of what she's going to teach you along with the files that she's using to teach you. Okay. Uh, please welcome Jessica. And Jessica, thank you for doing this. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to this presentation today. Um, like Neha said, I'm going to be showing you how to use these tools, um, talking with each tool a particular example of how we implemented this in our own data analysis. Um, before I get into that, I just want to add something onto the discussion that we had yesterday about how metabolomics data analysis in particular is a bottleneck within the metabolomics workflow. And so, yes, it is. Metabolomics data analysis is challenging. It, at times, will be frustrating. So if you're, if you're at that point in, your, um, in the process, like, it's OK. Thankfully, we have a bunch of in silico tools uh, that are coming out. Uh, there's novel tools all the time. And to me, it's very exciting. Uh, I've been doing this for four years. It's always exciting when a new tool comes out to explore how can I fit this into the pipeline, into the typical data analysis that I do, and how can I interface this with other tools in order to more rapidly identify metabolites and give myself further confidence in the annotations. So where there's a bottleneck, there's room for innovation. Um, there's room for discovery. So while at times you may feel um, that it is a challenge, just try to remain determined and excited because there's, uh, there's a lot to be discovered. So with that, um, Jessica and Neha yesterday gave great presentations on metabolomics background and how metabolomics has been applied within several systems. Hopefully by now you're all comfortable with mass spectrometry fragmentation and understand the need to generate at least MS-MS spectra in order to identify metabolites. So our MS2 spectra, we're fragmenting our molecules. It's kind of like a puzzle. Um, if the int intact molecule is a puzzle, then as we fragment, we're breaking off puzzle pieces, so to speak, and detecting those, we're trying to identify each of the fragments. One of the tools that we rely on and love to use uh, relies on molecular networking. And so molecular networking will group spectra, MS2 spectra, that are above a certain threshold similarity. So you have these spectra um, representing metabolite features. Um, so sometimes it's a unique metabolite, sometimes it's an adduct or an in-source fragment. But we essentially have metabolite features. And what molecular networking will do is represent those MS2 spectra as nodes. So every time I see a node, I think unique metabolite feature. Spectra <clears throat> that have a certain uh, similarity will be grouped together. And so that's useful for visualizing large sets of data. And then um, you know, once you, if you can identify a particular molecule, then you can go to the spectra, look at shifts in the fragment peaks, and work to identify these additional mo uh, molecules based on um, your chemical knowledge. And so we have our MS1, MS2 spectra. 
we work to match the spectra with library compounds. Um, and then, like I said, if you have two, uh, if you have a known metabolite feature, then any metabolite feature with spectral similarity, you can theoretically annotate the, um, fun the functional group differences based on the chemical shifts in the MS2 spectra. So there's excellent documentation about how to make a molecular network. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go too much into that. Um, but with all these tools, there's great documentation. There's great support online. This would be the link that you'd go to to make a molecular network. Here's where the documentation is. Um, if you have any questions about this, I'm happy to talk afterwards. But I want to show you a number of tools. So we'll just say, once you've made a molecular network, what can you do with it? So one advantage to molecular networks is the ability to visualize metadata. And if you're unfamiliar with the term metadata, this is essentially descriptors or attributes of your data. So if we were to, if we were to list metadata of everyone in the room, we could say our heights, where we're from, who we work for. Um, and so each of those is an attribute or a descriptor. And so molecular networking allows you to uh, visualize this data across each of the metabolite features. And so, for example, in this network, I've got particular metabolite features in one condition, particular metabolite features that are dominant in another condition. This might be indicative of a biotransformation. This might be indicative of particular analogs of, of, of a compound class being more abundant in one condition versus the other. So it's um, a great way to, if you're looking, OK, what do I annotate? Well, this is a very interesting phenomenon. I'll start here. Um, you can add the pi, add pi's to the node based on the detect, detection intensity. You can change your shapes of the nodes. You can change your borders. There's a lot you can do to visualize lots of metadata within the network and identify what might be biologically interesting in terms of your question. Um, we also like to use upset plots. And so these are analogous to Venn diagrams. Uh, Venn diagrams and Euler diagrams, once you get more than three or four groups, they tend to be very difficult to read. And so I really like upset plots because you can look at multiple sets and you can look at the intersection and the distribution of these. Here we're just showing um, all the unique features, but upset plots can be quite helpful. Uh, you read, this is your sample, this is the number of metabolites, or the intersection in which it's describing. And then this is the number of features. OK, so let's get into actually using these tools. So let's say you upload your spectra. You run it through GNPS, um, which is the global molecular network, uh, molecular networking social platform. And you get a library match. So how do you visualize this? So we're going to go to a job that I ran. When you run your molecular network, this is your output page. So I like to start first by view all library hits. Okay. And so you can see I have 355 hits. That's a decent number of hits. It's a lot to go through. And so when I'm looking at the library hits, I like to start um, by reading the compound names and trying to identify, oh, is this a molecule that's biologically interesting that I would expect to find in my data. This particular molecule, I've read the literature. Um, it's one that, oh, it might be in my data, and perhaps it is. It's been a library match. So I'm going to click on View Mirror Match and compare the spectra. So this top spectra is my experimental spectra. The bottom spectra will always be the library spectrum. So I look and I see the black and the green peaks. I seem to be matching up nicely. So it looks like a good match. Um, I'll also, what I'll also do is take my experimental mass to charge and compare it to a theoretical mass to charge to see if the PPM error is within the tolerance that it should be for the particular instrument that I'm using. So um, I recommend using the theoretical you know, from PubChem, from any other database, go grab the theoretical mass to charge value. Compare your compound to that value. 
So looks like we have a good match, um, which is great. I can, um, you know, I would go and I would try to annotate my peaks. What I can also do is make a publication uh, level, quali publication quality figure from this output as well. So I'm going to close the view mirror match. I'm going to go to USI links. At USI stands for Universal Spectrum um, Identifier. So when I say USI, it's just a Essentially, it's just a, a link that is specific to this particular spectrum. OK. So I clicked on Mirror Match USI. It opened the plotter for me. So there's a number of things that I can do here. The first thing uh, that I like to do is just double check and see, oh, yes, this is, this is mine. Um, this top spectra is mine. This bottom one is from the library, mostly because it says library. So, all right, I'm confident this is my spectra. This is the experimental spectra. I can change the figure size. I can change my mass range. So if I'd like to zoom in on the peaks that are, or zoom in on the region in which I'm generating fragment peaks, I can do that. Change the maximum intensity. Some of my peaks are being cut off. And I'm going to change label precision. I'm using a QTOF, so. In my publication, I'm going to report out to three decimal places. Um, so we've got the figure. And then you can see, you know, you can briefly check the PPM error of the, fra of the fragment peaks as well. You can see I have a peak here that's not labeled. Uh, so let's do that. All I have to do is click. And then this is the library spectrum. I'm going to sort by intensity to make it a little easier to find that peak. There it is, 86. And it will update. And now my spectrum will be labeled. So kind of when it comes to labeling peaks, label those peaks that you, know, you want to highlight attention, that you want to show, yes, these are matching peaks. Um, gives further support. Uh, gives you, a, I think, a level 3 or a level 2 annotation. So then what you can do is you can download this. Um, as a, I recommend downloading as an SVG, uh, especially if you use Adobe or other tools to further uh, manipulate your figures. But download as SVG, and now you have a figure that can go into a publication. So let's see. I think that's everything with that. Any questions on the MS2 spectra plotter? OK. So that was a case in which we do have an annotation. We have a match to a library. Excellent. What do you do when you don't have a library match? Well, there are several tools that we like to use. These are tools that are based on in silico methods. Um, in silico refers to an operation that's being performed by a computer. So if it's an in silico spectra, a computer used some algorithm to predict this spectra. Um, and all in silico spectra should be further verified. All right. So for us, we noticed uh, in one of our workflows, hey, we have this cluster of metabolite features. They are all unique to this particular bacterium. We don't have any library matches for any of these. But given the unique biological conditions, let's try to annotate this cluster. So we come in with our biological question. This is a cluster we're interested in. Let's try to annotate. So if we go back to the network, all right. So these are all my library hits. What if I want to look at every single metabolite feature that I detected? I'm going to click on View All Spectra with IDs. Okay, This is a very large job, so you might get this. Um, I'm going to say show results anyway. Actually, I did this before. So here are all my results. <clears throat> and sorry. <clears throat> so I have 9,600 9, metabolite features. That's a lot. How do I find the particular one I'm interested in? You can either search by that precursor M to Z. This is coming from your MS1. Or by cluster index. This is this is a number that is used to call up a metabolite feature. So it has meaning within the context of your job. 
But outside of that, no one is going to you know, recognize, oh, cluster index number 12. Like That's meaningful to you. And when you're interfacing between some of these tools, this carries over. It's kind of like you know you have your first name, your last name, and let's say we all randomly assigned you a number. So you'd have first name, last name, and a random number to identify you. That's essentially what's going on here. Yeah, the known number in the network. So, so it's, re it's referred to, um, depending on the tool, it's referred to as cluster index, node number. Um, some of them, confusingly, we'll call it scan. Um, but I'll, I'll highlight that where it is, right? because we know that your instrument will give you a scan number. There's no connection between the scan number your instrument has given you and this cluster index. So, OK, so. I'm going to go after this particular metabolite here, 480. So I'll search by the precursor. And then organize. So here it is. I'm going to click on View Network. So this means it's clustering with other features. It has some MS2 spectral similarity that's been identified. If it's blank like this, this means that it's a singleton node the algorithm, the parameters you chose to run with did not identify um, in this first go around any other spectra that were similar. So. so I can see my feature in browser. This is the cluster index. I can choose to label it with the parent mass, which is sometimes more informative. So I'm going to do that. If I click on the node itself, uh, I get the MS2 spectra uh, within the browser. And then what I can also do is on the edges, I can put in the master charge values of every node that this particular node is connected. And that's useful. Um, if we look here, for example, here's a difference of 14.016 Daltons. Um, I know that that corresponds to CH2. So oh, that's, you know, that's interesting. I'm going to click now on the edge, I'm going to get both spectra, 480, 494. I'm going to come over here, hit Align Spectra. And what that will do is report to me all the peaks that are similar and that are shifted. So all the red peaks are the peaks that are identical, 268, 268. And then if I hover, I see 357 and 343. So there's a peak that shifted by 14 Daltons. So that's useful. Um, it can, I can now know which peaks belong to my conserved substructure of the molecule, and I know which peaks belong to the uh, substructure of the molecule that's chemically altered. All right. OK. So another. So this is, this is useful if I want to see in browser uh, these molecules stacked. What I can also do is I can put these in the, in the MS2 spectral plotter. So I'll go back to this page. Um, if I click USI links, this opens up a link for this metabolite feature. I'm going to click it, open up the plotter. While I'm doing that, I'm going to call up that other metabolite. That was 494.26. There it is. I'm going to copy this link now. So this is why USIs are useful, because I can paste that USI link under the spectrum USI. And now I've got my two spectra. And so if I'm able to identify one of these nodes, I've already got the, the template for my publication quality figure ready to go. So. Uh, we'll just leave that there. And let's go to actually identifying this molecule. So the first tool in Silico tool that I'll share is mole discovery. Here's the manuscript um, describing the in-depth details about how this tool works. Um, but essentially, what mole discovery does is generate fragmentation graphs of small molecules. It was um, built using several databases, um, including a marine database. So you'll find, um, you can go in, you can see which databases were used to build it, and if it, you're going to expect to find bio biologically relevant predictions for the data set that you're working with. But these fragmentation graphs, essentially, 
the algorithm fragments the molecule, generates this fragmentation graph to which it compares your experimental input to. If the match is over a certain threshold, it will report a, that metabolite as a candidate for your um, experimental metabolite feature. Will Discovery reports one candidate per metabolite feature, and sometimes if you have isomers, for example, sometimes it will report the same candidate for multiple features. So at that point, you'd want to uh, evaluate the raw data yourself. And the other thing that Jessica mentioned yesterday that does the similar thing, the scoring is different, is MetPad. That one is also a useful tool, does the same thing, predicts and compares. Uh, sometimes, depending upon the biological system you're using, one tool works better than the other because the databases they use are different. So I always recommend that don't be married to a tool. You know, try all that there are because your goal is to annotate your model. Yeah, if you have access to five tools, submit your input to all five tools. These, they're, they're very uh, user-friendly, easy to run, and um, yeah, doesn't, doesn't hurt to, to run it through all your tools. Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> so you, you, you will get conflicting results. Um, I would use both results and, and try them out. So we're at the stage where I've, I've gotten conflicting results from certain tools, and sometimes, sometimes one tool is right, sometimes the other tool is right. You, we really are at the stage where um, you do need to manually verify the in silico prediction, um, but it's, it's a lot nicer than looking at the MS2 and being like, OK, let me try to make a chemical structure versus, OK, one tool is saying this molecule, one tool is saying that molecule. One step I like to employ prior to uh, taking the molecule, fragmenting it, is looking at the biological relevance. So if one tool is predicting a metabolite from, from a tree, and the other tool is predicting a metabolite from a marine bacterium, I'm going to start with the marine bacterium since my system is corals marine. I'm going to start there. That doesn't mean it's impossible that the metabolite that comes from the tree couldn't be in my system, but there's more biological relevance to the marine bacterium. I'll start there. I'll see. Also manually annotating your, you know, predict the, the peaks that that tool predicts that match with yours, depending on, on your instrument. Tops give very high resolution and it's just, you know, uh, high mass accuracy and that's spectra. That's why we use top and we are doing MS2 annotations for small molecules. So your uh, fragment peaks for our instrument should also be lower than but with Orbitrap, we see MS1 is higher accuracy, but MS2 is not. Right? So just you know, take a known molecule, see what your MS2 accuracy is for your fragments. Your fragment matches should also be within the PP PPM accuracy of your instrument. So sometimes that helps. So we assign chemical formulas to fragments and then predict their PPM accuracy. OK, so this is mole discovery. Um, I should briefly mention, when you're creating a molecular network, your input is going to include a, what's called an MGF file, and this contains the information of your MS1 and MS2 spectra. It's in a format that these tools can read. So MGF, think I have MS1 information, MS2 information. Um, depending on the network, you'll also include a quantification table. This came from whatever pre-processing you chose to do on your spectra. And then you can also include metadata as well. So generating these MGF, these quant files, these metadata files is useful because they can be submitted not only to molecular networking, but these tools as well. So with mole discovery, you'll put a title. It gets angry if you don't. You're going to select your input file. So this, um, these programs work with a uh, client server that hosts your files. It, if you log in to GNPS and, and you look at the documentation, um, it will tell you what you, like, you need to download um, a client server and you know, drag and drop your files. Then you can access them from the browser. So I'm going to input 
this MGF file under input file, finish my selection. If I want to change my ion mass tolerance, I can do that. And then there's additional um, under advanced options if I want to change the types of databases I'm looking through, change the mass char maximum charge that I want it to consider, um, other parameters. But essentially, I've uploaded, I hit submit, and it runs. The larger your file is, the longer it will run for. But once it's done, your output oops, will look like this. So it, you'll, get a, you'll get an email um, with whatever email you gave them, and it'll say, the job is done. Go here, you click that link, and now you have the link. The cool thing about these links is you don't have to be logged in, and you don't have to be the person who ran the job in order to access the output. So if, if you're trying to collaborate with someone and they want access, all you have to do is send them the link to the output page. They put it in. They have access to everything. They can clone the job themselves. They'd have to have access to the input files for that to work, but um, it's very shareable, very accessible. So we're going to hit view all MSMs at a load. And so this tool is able to give me predictions for 2,600 features. And so I'm going to search by, this is my spectral match. Remember, we were looking at that compound M to Z 480. And it turns out it's predicting that this compound is uh, a metabolite called andromed. So what's useful here is that they provide me a smiles. I can copy this into ChemDraw or your um, program of choice. I can look at the structure. Uh, what I'll do is I'll Google what is Andromed, I'll see where it's being reported in the literature. And this um, was a successful prediction in terms of we, we were able to verify it. So just want to drive home the point. In silico predictions must be verified. So with Andromed, uh, the first thing, mole discovery predicted this compound. And so first up is, okay, I'm, in, I'm interested. Andromed is a known virulence factor from Pacific Vibrio Corolliticus. This, uh, you saw from the molecular network I showed earlier, that was a Vibrio Corolliticus strain. Okay, so there's biological relevance. Now what I'm going to do is manually check the fragmentation, as, as Neha said, check the PPM errors appropriate for my instrument in terms of the fragments and the overall master charge. Then what I'd like to do is check literature for reported spectra. So the GNPS library is extensive, um, but there are other libraries out there as well. And you know, it never hurts to dig into NIST, into HMDB, Metlin, Look into literature for MS2 spectra that may have been reported and published that you can compare your experimental spectra to. So we, we did that. Um, there was no reported spectrum for andromid, but we did find a spectrum from literature for a compound called isoleucine andromid in which this valine residue has been substituted for an isoleucine residue. And so we noticed that the two fragment peaks between these spectra that match perfectly correspond to the conserved substructure within these molecules. And the one peak that differed by 14 Daltons corresponds to the substructure of the molecule that has that amino acid that differs by 14 Daltons. So this gave us further confidence in that annotation. Uh, you can check if there are chemical standards available right, to get that level one uh, annotation. Sometimes there are, sometimes there are not. In our case, uh, andromid was not available as a chemical standard. So what we did is we went to collaborators and we asked them, does this particular bacterium that I'm looking, that I'm investigating, have the biosynthetic gene cluster? And it did. So that gave us even further confidence. Not only do my spectrum match, but my bacterium can uh, synthesize this. So this really highlights 
the, the importance and the value of pairing omics techniques when you can. So from this, once we were able to annotate Andromed, we were able to propagate annotations based on shifts and um, annotate these analogs. We found some biosynthetic precursors as well within this network. This was all based on looking at the MS2 fragmentation. So um, you need to confirm the in-silico prediction by mole discovery. Uh, this is one of those tools that um, you sit, you look, at the, you look at the MS2 spectra, you work to fragment. There are tools out there, um, some of Jessica mentioned some of them yesterday, that can help you predict fragments. Um, you can read into literature to see which chemical bonds might try to fragment, so you can work and uh, yeah, work to, to assess substructures to the fragment peaks. Okay, any questions on that tool? I don't think so. I th because it's, yeah. Um, it's comparing the fragmentation graphs, so I think you would need MSMS -MS data. Yeah. So, all right. Right, and so so you are limited by the the known knowns for these tools, but I think that's if we go back to networking, that's where this value can come in. Where we had some name compounds, but if you have an unknown unknown within your network, and you're able to ident identify based off of a known known, then oh now you know based on the chemical shifts. So it's it's useful in pulling out those I guess unknown knowns. Um, and then if you have unknown unknowns that have spectral similarity that are clustering, then that's how you can get at those. Yes. Also, this analog search, do you want to mention like the dry triple plus paper that you're talking about? Mm. Annotated? So sometimes what happens is you can do an analog search. So you won't match an exact find. Your compound is nowhere in the database, but a compound similar to that might be. So if you do analog search, you'll it will find a compound that matches, that has a substructure similar to your compound that then helps you propagate. But there, the accuracy is even lower. Analog yeah. search, like, a lot of times it's incorrect. But sometimes it is. Jessica annotated one of our molecules from there. Like, we had no hits in any of the databases. And then by found a compound that was similar to it, and then yeah. she was able to propagate the annotation. Like I said, she's one of the most creative kids in the lab. That's a good question. So if they're not, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly talk about that. If, they're, if a molecule is not fragmenting, at that point, I would go back and I would redesign my MSMS method, um, and I would change the fragmentation energy. Um, gotcha, gotcha. We can, we can talk more if you want. Yeah, but that's a, that's a fun, not well, not fun, but it's an unfun challenge. Um, if it's if it's known and it doesn't fragment, then you would probably find that in literature. But if it's unknown and it doesn't fragment, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good challenge. OK, let's talk about cannabis now, which uh, predicts chemical class. So if you, let's say, yeah, you have an unknown unknown, and you can't find a 
match in, in any of the databases. Well, worry not, there's still information that you can provide about this particular molecule. And this tool, as it says, predicts chemical classes. So it's all in line with this, um, with this application called Sirius. So Siri what Sirius does is it uh, computes putative chemical formulas based on the MS1 data. It generates fragmentation trees based on your MS2 data. And then uh, you have a program called CSI Finger ID, which takes that output. It, transfor um, it transforms the spectra into predicted structural fingerprints, and then it matches your experimental fingerprints with fingerprints it's generated based off of molecules and databases. And then Canopus utilizes the CSI Finger ID output um, based on the predicted structural fingerprint to propose chemical classes. So, ah, so quickly, Neha presented this example yesterday in which we had a group of unknown compounds. We used Canopus to predict the class. And then once we had an idea of what this class was, we were able to go back into literature, search, and then identify these as um, pyrazine and oxides. So, okay. Now the tool predicts them. Yeah. Now the tool is updated. The, the chemical was recently isolated, so somebody uploaded it to Hopkins. So now CSI finger ID will tell us it's pyrazine and oxide. We don't even have to do it. <laughs> so this is serious. Um, you can download it, run it um, on your computer. You open the application. It's already open, so. Um, and you do have to create a free, um, it's free, but you have to create a login. This is just so that the um, people who host Sirius know that, yes, you're, you're a real person trying to, trying to use their system. So you'll close this page. And this is the. This is what this looks like. So you can run in batch mode. You can also run individual compounds. So I'm going to run one of the compounds from that cluster. All right. So I hit import compound. I hit this plus signal. What I need to do is I need to generate an Excel file um, that has an MS1 mass list and an MS2 mass list. You can save these files as different. You know, a different type of import. I like to use CSV. I'm going to actually open this and show you what this mass list looks like. So in the Google um, Drive, this is called 151 or 153.1 MS1, 153.1 MS2. So it's a very simple input. This is my master charge value. This is my intensity. That's all you need. So I'm going to open that in Sirius, my MS1. Okay, mass, column one, yes. Intensity, column two, yes. I'm going to change MS level to MS1 and say okay. Now it's telling me that my precursor mass is 153. Um, that is correct based on this molecule. If you're looking at something that's halogenated um, or that has an isotopic pattern in which your precursor mass is not the most intensive peak, you'll want to open this up and choose the, the peak that you believe is the, the precursor. So this is 153. Now I'm going to add the MS2, hit the plus, select my MS2 file. My mass is in column one, my intensity is in column two, my MS level is two. And then if you do know your collision energy, you can add that. Uh, if you've ramped your instrument, you can add that as well, uh, but it's not necessary. So we'll say OK. Um, so I'm just going to put in one MS1 and one MS2 for this metabolite feature. We'll call it something. Um, if you suspect you know what the adduct is, you can specify that. I usually like to keep it unknown because I'll let, I'll let the tool uh, tell predict it for me, and then I'll evaluate the tool's prediction. So you're going to say import, and here is where your feature is. Um, to compute an individual feature, I'm going to right click and select compute. Um, I could also have said 
compute all. It will bring up the same interface. So I want to run Sirius. In order to do that, I'm going to click this. I can specify the elements. I can specify the instrument that I used, the mass accuracy that I want these predictions to have, the number of candidates I want reported, which databases to look in. Um, I'd for the, for uh, formula prediction, I usually say don't limit to the database because this will limit use databases in only or use formulas from only these databases. For unknown unknowns, maybe it's not in the database. So we'll just say none. Uh, CSI finger ID, want it to predict. Um, I'm going to use a fallback addict of M plus H. You know your system. You know what addicts are generated. Search databases for structure. I'm going to have it search all the databases. And then finally, Canopus. Uh, this is additional people who use the tool. All I have to do is click, tell it to run. And then I hit Compute. And it will load. And this one ran pretty fast. Nice. So this is running, running. Let's go here. This is the exact same job. I just ran it beforehand. Uh, for time purposes. So you can see the formulas it's predicting. Um, this is a fragmentation tree. So this is saying to get from this to this fragment, you lose water. To get from this to this fragment, you're losing a hydroxyl group. Um, so it's trying to explain every single one of the fragments in the MS2 spectra that you uploaded. This is also helpful when you're trying to annotate. Um, if I get an in silico prediction for mole discovery, I like to run that feature in Sirius to aid me in my annotation of the MS2 spectra. So. Oh, so this is why I, I, my opinion, I feel like Canopus does the best job in predicting chemical formulas because it takes both MS1 and MS2 into account. So if something doesn't fit your, if a chemical formula doesn't, or the fragmentary patient tree from the chemical formula does not fit your experimental MSMS, that chemical formula gets a lower score. So the scoring of chemical formulas is really, really the CASME challenge that Jessica mentioned, Canopus did the best when it came to predicting correct chemical formula. Yeah. So, so yeah, the scoring is, is really, it's very robust. It's, it's very well done. Um, sometimes you'll have 100%. Sometimes you have three results. In that, in that case, if, you know, the score is the same for multiple candidates, evaluate each of those candidates. Do you have a question? Gotcha. Okay, so yeah, this for this particular, this is C8H12N2O. I see from the MS plan, this is a lot of MS plus. Is that from this MS1? Ah, yes. Okay. So I wonder. So yeah, so this is this is where you'd want to go back and you'd want to look at your MS1. That might that might not be correct, but um. Yeah. It's a. MS one is important. MS two yeah. helps. MS one, you know, from the isotopic pattern, you'll generate a bunch of chemical formulas. From the fragmentation tree, it helps provide scores to those chemical which one is more likely because they fit the fragmentation mm. tree. Um, yeah, this might not be the... the scan for MS1, but we yeah. ha heavily annotated this molecule. That's mm -hmm. not the correct isotopic pattern, I can tell you. Yeah, that, that doesn't fit the isotopic pattern. So when it got copied over, that one shouldn't be in there. So there, it does, t again, take chemical ingenuity to look at your MS scan, especially if you're pulling this from the raw data, and be able to identify which peaks fit might fit the isotopic formula. Um, so you do have to have some, some chemical knowledge. If you're not sure, I would, I would copy as many peaks as possible, put it in, see if the tool comes up with something that's intelligible or helps you narrow down, OK, wait. That peak, that doesn't fit that an isotopic pattern that I would expect. Let's exclude that rerun. Also, usually you don't do this manually. Like, so he, yeah. she, she, she's showing you manually for one compound. You usually use enzymine or the compound discoverer for all these labs to do your feature detection and get your MS1, MS2, and 
as two and TF5, right? So here she did that manually. She just went to the software, got the peak, and got the intensity. But you don't do that manually. You do, do it with the software. So these mistakes don't happen when you do it with the software. Mm -hmm. So the prediction is more or less like a bottom up ruling. Start with MS2, then go to the MS1 level. No, start with MS1. You'll, from the isotropic pattern, you'll have chemical formulas. But for most compounds, you'll get, it depends on the compound, but you'll get like 10, somewhere between 10 to 50 chemical formulas predicted. So which chemical formula is the most likely chemical formula? MS2 helps predict that. The cost of the geos, from every chemical formula, you can generate a fragmentation tree. Match that with the fragmentation tree of your experimental study. Then you look for these fragmentation patterns in the road end. Yep, so we've got putative structures, um, but I just want to highlight with cannabis that it is predicting this molecule as a pyrazine. We go to the literature, we search for known pyrazines, and then we're able to identify these compounds. Now you can show them CSI finger trajectory correctly if you chose the correct ah. database. Yes, oops. So CSI finger. So I'm going to filter by bio databases, and so um, it turned out that what we were able to annotate from the literature, CSI finger ID was also predicting. Um, so second compound is the correct compound. Yeah. If you look at first and second, they're just positional isolation. Right? Yeah. So it's doing a really good job of predicting. Mm -hmm. So you can copy the inchi into ChemDraw software of choice, and again work to generate the fragments from the overall structure. Okay, so that's cannabis. Um, I'll just quickly mention, like there are instances in which the tools agree. Um, it, there was for this particular compound. So both mole discovery and CSI finger ID, we're predicting this to be ikarugamycin. Uh, once we, once we ver uh, validated or became more comfortable with the predictions, we further supported this uh, using an analytical standard. So it's nice when your tools agree with each other. OK, I'm going to go to MS2LDA. So we saw a cluster of nodes. But what happens when your cluster of metabolite features doesn't have any annotations or you have a single node? You can use something um, called MS2LDA which is an unsupervised substructure discovery in order to see if, well, there might be some le level of MS2 spectral similarity between this cluster or this particular node and other clusters in your data, um, right? Reasons nodes might be spectrally similar and not clustered together, you might have a large amount of noise, and that's going to make it, make it appear to the algorithm that they're not spec as similar, and it turns out they are, um, or if you have small number of fragmentation peaks or whatever parameters you choose to set up your network with, maybe they were too strict in order to identify that these two spectra are similar. So you, we, we go back, we use MS2LDA to kind of further help us discover substructures. So what's a substructure? It's a substructure of a molecule um, that would be shared between uh, fragment peaks. Um, recommend reading this paper in order to understand how this is done. Um, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll go past that. But practically speaking, OK, I have this unknown metabolite of interest. It's in a condition in which, hey, I can identify this and answer part of my biological question. There are no annotations using a database search. Does it share a substructure with a known molecule? That's the question. So what I do is I run MS2LDA. And what MS2LDA did is it pulled out all these features for me. And it said that these shared a substructure. And what was really interesting is that this shared a substructure with this node, which was a GNPS library match to desferoxamine E. And so if I look at the motif that they share, and using, using this spectra to help me annotate these peaks, I saw, oh, 
This, is, this motif is characteristic of a hydroxamate siderophore. So essentially, I took an unknown, found that it, was, it shared some type of substructure with a known. I looked at what type of a substructure does it share, and it shares something uh, hydroxamate siderophore. So now what I can do is I can go back to the databases, I can go back to the literature and perform a guided search uh, for uh, siderophores, and I can look for I can look for features or uh, metabolites that might match this mass to charge. But I could also look for analogs and try to use analogs to help me um, propose a structure. So, all of these annotations go into tools like CVS, Canvas, libraries. Better and better in silico tools. Since silico tools are using machine learning machine learning will do as good as their training data set, right? As training set data sets get more and more advanced, more and more uh, more and more spectra, spectral data is in the databases, their training sets will get better and better, so their predictions will get better and better, right? So whatever we annotate, we upload into as many databases as possible. So you know next time this tool runs, it does even better prediction for other people for us. So in order to run MS2LDA, right, I'm back at my feature, at my molecular network, back at, at the status page. I'm going to go to advanced views and select analyze with MS2LDA. Put the title. It carried over all my input files, which was very nice. I can specify parameters, um, can change these. The literature does a great job of explaining which each of these are. Um, you can also hover over it. It will tell you what is this parameter, and so that when you're changing it, you, you can be informed as to what you're doing. But MS2LDA is all ready to run, so I'll hit submit, and it will start running. So this is what the status page will look like. I can copy, I can copy this link, come back to it later when the job is done. Then I get that output. So ran this before. Let's go to the output. Oops. Okay, there's three major components that I want to highlight. If you use Cytoscape to visualize your data, um, you can download the Cytoscape data. You can download the motif PDF. Highly recommend you do this. And then go, go to um, individual motif details. This is my motif PDF. These are all my motifs. If I search for, oh, that's useful. OK. So that unknown metabolite had a precursor mass of 585, 585.3. Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay, I just give a little bit of an overview then going. Okay. Um, so, to briefly wrap up this tool, I found my metabolite of interest. There are two motifs predicted. I can go, I'll just search this one, I can go to my PDF, search that motif. And so, this is the motif that it's pulling out. Here are all the fragments. Fragments are at the top. It also identifies neutral losses. These are reported at the bottom. Here's what this, the motif looks like. Here are the next page is the reported fragments. So um, I can use that um, to help me further annotate the spectra. Um, that's all in here. Um, yeah, to, get to be able to fit some of these tools in. So that was a unsupervised substructure discovery. There's also a tool, recent tool that per, uh, performs what we call supervised substructure discovery. And so this tool, um, what it can do is it, let's say you have a compound, you've annotated it, you know, so in our case, this was this uh, DGCC. So I know based, based on looking at this and other spectra, or you, know, you can know or you can hypothesize what are characteristic fragment peaks within your spectra? So these are 
characteristics of the head group. Um, I know of several analogs of this molecule that contain the same head group. So I want to find all the molecules in my data set that are structurally related. So I know my two characteristic fragment peaks. I've determined the pattern that I want to search. These can be based off of fragments, neutral losses, isotopic patterns. Great documentation and examples can be found. If you need help constructing your query, you can go to this um, in-browser sandbox, which helps you write the query so that the program will understand what you're looking for. And that's why I chat GPT can write these queries. And the person who developed these tools, Mingman, got chat GPT to write the queries for you. Um, so I wrote my query. It translated into English for me so that I understood what I was looking for. It's saying I'm looking for these peaks at this certain tolerance. It's translated into nine additional languages, so if English is not your first language, um, it will translate your query so that you'll be able to understand what you're looking for. Here's where you can run the workflow. It's pretty simple. Um, you add your title, your query. One thing I want to highlight is you'll have to change this, um, and this is in the documentation, but change this extract found MS spectra to yes. Why? Because then, you, based on the results, you can go and do networking. So. It's quite useful. Um, and then finally, MAST. Uh, this allows us to mine public repositories. So when you have published your data, it's great to upload it. Um, and this is very beneficial in order for you know, us to be able to do citizen science, collaborative science. For this, um, you run this from your FBMN. I've listed out here what you can do. Um, and so let's see. I'll show you. Okay, I'll just show you the output. So this was that Andromeda Peak. You can hit a link mass spectrum. Takes you to an output that looks like this. So you put. Do you want to give a little bit of a background on what is mass? So like I have two minutes. MS2 blast. So basically, you take your MS2 spectra, you're searching all the public data sets to figure out which data set that molecule might be present in. For example, you know, you took uh, human gut samples, um, you did MS2 spectra on it, and then you search public data sets. So it's found in one of the micro. So you know that micro in your intestine is making that molecule. So that's what you're doing with mass. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're essentially searching your MS2 spectra against user uploaded MS2 spectra. Um, so this is all in that PowerPoint. Um, but what's useful is that essentially I get an output that tells me, oh, hey, your spectrum was a match to a spectrum from all these different jobs. And I can look and I can see, oh, is this biologically relevant? How good of a match it, is it? Et cetera, et cetera. So uh, yeah. So this is all in the PowerPoint. Um, in the interest of time, I will end here. But if you have any questions at all, like please feel free to ask me. Please feel free to reach out. I'm very responsive. Um, love, to, love to help. Uh, these are great tools. And the more that we use them, the more they can improve. And the more that we can develop additional tools that will help us annotate our metabolites. So thank you very much.